Today, I want us to look at the three gifts of utterance. You remember them? Three gifts of utterance. If you have not been with us, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We want to look at the last category. I know we have not talked about the second category, the, the gifts of power. To wake a power kando kwanza. Let's look at the gift of utterance, which is prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. First Corinthians twelve ten. We put can we have it on the screen? First Corinthians twelve ten. To another the working of miracles, that is he is giving, the Holy Spirit is giving, and to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now we are going to look at prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Praise God. Now if you feel like asking a question, you are free to do so. In this church, you never ask. You never say anything lest you disturb the Holy Ghost. You know? So even if you don't understand, you don't ask because you don't want to disturb the Holy Ghost. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 to 3. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Praise God. Love is mentioned, is talked about or discussed in chapter 13. And we looked at that. Then he says, now pursue that love. Amen. Pursue that love. Because it's the greatest. Because these gifts are useless if there is no love. They are meaningless if there is no love. These are not gifts to for people to show off. They are not gifts to make you famous. They are gifts for ministering to the body of Christ. Praise God. They have nothing to do with making a preacher famous or a believer famous or to give you a title. No, they are for the body of Christ. For ministering to the body of Christ to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he said, pursue love and desire spiritual Gift. So once you, be, you ground yourself in love, then you can desire the manifestation of spiritual gifts in your life. And say, but especially that you may prophesy. For he, now he gives a reason why he is, he is insisting on prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Praise God. Now get that. He who prophesies speaks edification exhortation and comfort to men. Praise God. You get that? Prophecy. Now he gives you the reason, verse 3 gives you the reason why he insists on desiring prophecy more than anything else. Because he who speaks or gives prophecy, you minister to one another. Amen. Amen. But if you speak in tongues, we will get to tongues. You are not speaking to us. You are not helping us. <laughs> Amen. So prophecy is given for the sake of comfort to one another. Comforting one another. 
this gift, this particular gift of prophecy, it comes to comfort the church. It's for comforting one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another, building one another. That's why it comes. That's why the gift is released. Praise God. And if you look at it carefully, you find that this is our basic responsibility to one another in the church. Which means, because we are all filled with the Holy Spirit, we, each one of us, has a measure of the Holy Spirit within us, which gives you the capacity to minister to each other in the body. Because we are one body, yet many members. You, you have a body, you have different parts of your body, and each part of the body ministers for the benefit of the rest of the body. So because we have the Holy Spirit in us, there is the capacity within each one of us to minister to one another. Praise God. So our basic responsibility to each other in church is to comfort one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another, and build one another in the house of God. Amen. And that is the idea or the essence of fellowships. Fellowships. When the Bible speaks to us about fellowships, this is the idea. So that we can minister to one another. It is the whole reason why we are called to come to church. Why we need to be faithful in church services. When we come to church, there are two things that happen when we come to church. One is we are gathering unto the Lord. Amen. We come together as a fellowship. We gather together unto the Lord. What does that mean? Every king, if you look at the Old Testament or these old times, every king who had a family, a king that had a family, had an appointed day where his family came together to appear in his presence. That was there. It was a tradition. They had a time. In fact, you find there's a time where David questioned Absalom. You remember Absalom? David questioned him because there was a time he was not appearing before the king with the rest of the family members. And the king wanted to know why are you not appearing with the rest? And even the heavenly king wants to know why you are not coming <laughs> when you do not appear. Praise God. The Bible speaks in the book of Job chapter is it chapter 2 or chapter 1? And there was a day when the sons of God gathered together to appear before the Lord. And even the devil was among them. <laughs> he also appears. He also comes. In fact, the book of Kings, uh, during the time of uh, Ahab, there was a meeting between Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and they were planning to go to war, and they called prophets to come and prophesy and they prophesied strange things, lies, the way we are hearing during elections. They prophesied funny things. And one prophet, Micaiah, a prophet called Micaiah, came. And he was the only one who had a word from heaven. And then he said, I saw a spirit before the Lord. <laughs> and it was actually a wrong spirit. It was a lying spirit. And it was there. So what does that tell you? Even spiritual beings appear before God. They gather unto the Lord. Praise God. So the saints gather together. When we come to a Sunday service like this one, I'm telling you we are not fulfilling a church tradition. We are fulfilling the will of God. It's a calling from heaven that the church must gather together unto her king. He is our king. Amen. Every church, if it was started well, not by rebellion, 
but started well and started by God. Every church started by God is a tribe as far as God is concerned. Is a tribe. There is no problem having many denominations. Those are tribes. Amen. Israel was one nation, but 12 tribes. And they spoke one language, but they were called one tribe. Every church fellowship, wherever they are located, those are tribes, but we are one. We appear before God as one. Amen. Different tribes. Can you give us Psalms 122? Psalms 122. Look at verse 1 to 4. We are one tribe. It has nothing to do with Kikuyu, Kamba, what, Nini. All those things came from the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Say amen. That one came from the Tower of Babel. God has a tribe. <laughs> amen. It's called the church. That church has different tribes. Look at 122, Psalms 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad. Do you know why David said those things? There was a time he was kept out of the house of God because of his mess. And then one day after he dealt with God, dealt with him and everything was in order and the prophet tells him, you can go to the house of the Lord. And joy filled his heart. He was missing it. Some of us don't miss when you don't go to church. But true men and women of God, when you don't appear before God, you feel it. You sense it. By the way, that's how you can test. You know you can test whether you are sick or not. Sometimes you go to your children, a baby, you want to check Joto. Up, eh? At a spiritually, you need to do this. You need to check yourself. David says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Why? We are going to gather unto the king to worship. Verse 2. Look at verse 2. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Verse 3. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Remember, he's talking about church. Sioile Yauko, your Palestine. He's talking about church. Verse 4. Now look at it. A city compact together where the tribes go up. The tribes of the Lord. See, the tribes of the Lord, it's a church. Amen. The tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. That's why we gather unto him. Amen. The reason for church services, you can't afford to miss at Kwasababu Kunabaridi. No. The other reason why we are there in that church is to build one another. We gather unto the Lord to worship him and to give thanks, to bless him for what be, he has done for us. But the other thing is to build one another. That's why we have church services. That's why we have small groups. That's why we have relationships encouraged in the Bible, friendships encouraged in the Bible, visiting each other is encouraged in the Bible. Why? To build one another. Praise God. And now building one another goes beyond just your capacity to do that or your strength to do that. And that's where the gift of prophecy comes in. Amen. Amen. We as believers must develop a culture. You have to develop it as a culture. Visiting one another. That should be a culture. Praise God. In this tribe we visit each other. <laughs> there is no selfishness in this tribe. Amen. Akuna. 
Hakuna. Kuna selfishness. In the house of God, it's not there. Selfishness is a product of hell. Doesn't come from heaven. So develop a culture. Every church, every believer must develop a culture of visiting one another. Develop a culture of going out together. Just to have tea, have coffee. Some of you have never done that for the last five years. You're even wondering what that is. Hey, I'm going to take coffee. I'm very sure some of you, if I give you a call now, I want to see you. The next thing is, what have I done? No. You don't think about fellowship. You're not thinking of anything else, but <laughs> have I sinned? That's why some pastors are very lonely. Because, can we meet? Have I sinned? But develop a culture of going out together. Praise God. As a believer, you need to build for yourselves accountability teams, accountability groups. You need to have a group you can sit with and be accountable to. People who can ask you today, you know, uliyanguka jan. <laughs> you know, you can only ask that question to someone with whom you have a relationship. You, know? you can't just come to me. <laughs> Last week, we'll call it you a know? We need accountability groups. Because some of you are dying slowly. And yet there is a cure next to you. But because there is no connection, there is no fellowship, you can't speak out. Tell your neighbor, may God help you. You need accountability groups. Amen. Yeah. Make calls. Call people. <laughs> Serious. You know sometimes you call people who are frustrated. <laughs> Make calls. Send text messages. Just to greet someone. Enda kwa social media. Wacha kuwatch some upuzi za TikTok. Angalia zile zikona good messages. Most of us, my friend, ado kenda kwa watu tuni. Watu wako hivi tu. Na ukiangalia zile vitu wanaona. Cartoons. <laughs> vitu zingine very meaningless. You know, even sinners prophesy. There is a sinner who prophesied, I think in the year 1999. An unbeliever. Who prophesied what people are doing today with phones. In fact, I have that clip. And he said things. He said a time is coming when we will be on our phones and all what we will be doing is scrolling. Scrolling, scrolling and scrolling and scrolling will never stop. It will just keep on scrolling and men will be going to the toilet with, with phones, just scrolling, just scrolling. Most of the time, he's, he's the one saying that we will be coming from our bathrooms and we will not use our towels to dry ourselves. Because we will be quickly running to the bedroom to, where for, to get our phone. Where we left it to check whether there is a message. And then we start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling until we dry up. You know. Just scrolling. That man was prophesying. And then he says. And we will stop even texting messages, we will be responding with some little faces of cuts. <laughs> you know? And those things were not there in 1999. Isn't some little images, smiling faces of cuts? And what? And people, some people will be spending hours watching funny cartoons of animals, cats chasing one another. 
You know. <laughs> he said those things and then, if, then finally he stopped and said, maybe I'm just guessing. Maybe I'm just guessing. You know. The man who was prophesying. <laughs> so don't be caught in those things. Build one another. Praise God. I'm going to show you some scriptures. Let's look at Hebrews. I'm still there, by the way. I'm not off topic. Eh? <laughs> I'm not off topic. We are still there. Hebrews 10. Look at Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Okay, look at, look, look at verse, uh, verse 23. From verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Praise God. That's what it is. Building one another. Stirring up one another towards love and good works. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Look at your neighbor and don't ask them a question. You know. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of, put a name there. But, but, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Praise God. Which day? Which day? The coming of the Lord. Praise God. And Jesus can come in two ways. Any of the two can happen anytime. He can appear in the air and call his church. Rapture. Praise God. And we will disappear. We do not know when that is going to happen. It can happen anytime. Right now. And believers have to be ready because that day is very near. Very near. Jesus can appear anytime. Now, if he doesn't come in the rapture to take you up, he can also come and kill you. By killing you, that is. Not in the wrong way. Eh? I'm not saying killing you in the wrong way. You can die. <laughs> so you can either die and go alone. Anytime, we don't know. Or you can come in a rapture and you go. But the fact is, the day is near. We do not know. Each one of us here, one day, by the way, last night as I was sleeping, I was thinking of how my body will be rotten in the grave and maybe the casket will be so beautiful it will not rot quickly. And I was thinking funny things anyway. But you see, it is my body that will be there. But I will be gone. But the Bible says, before that day comes, develop a culture of stirring each other towards good works. Amen. In fellowship. Because that time is near. Look at, Hebrew, look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we read from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14. Therefore, he says, Awake. Awake. You who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Arise from the dead. You are the other side. Anyone who is not born again is living in death. <laughs> that lifestyle is death. So wake up from there. Amen. Get yourself out of there. Christ will give you light. 
verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now walking circumspectly means be careful. Be very careful. You're walking like a soldier in the battlefield. You want to discern where the enemy is hiding. Carefully so that you do not step on landmines. That's walking circumspectly. Knowing that anything can happen anytime. And it is your carefulness that will save you and keep you alive in the battlefield. So this is what he's talking about. See then that you walk circumspectly. Also being aware that everything you are doing has consequences. So not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The reason why he's using wine here and the Holy Spirit is because wine influences people. You drink, people do things, and then you hear things like, uh, he did that under the influence of. Under the influence of. Say, so do not be influenced by wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Speaking. Look at verse 19. As a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Are you getting that? Speaking to one another in psalms. In hymns. In spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A lot of gifts of, the, of prophecy are manifested in those manners. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Praise God. That is what is called fellowship. Where we are building one another. And we each, because we have the Holy Spirit, we all have a capacity within us to do this. To build. To speak a word of encouragement. A word, of, a, a word that will build someone. A word that will uplift the soul of someone. We all have that capacity and you cannot say you have no gift. No. We have that capacity. But there is a specific gift called the gift of prophecy which goes a little bit further than this general expectation of Christians. Amen. You know the general expectation for believers is you meet together to build one another. And we all have that capacity if you have the Holy Spirit. But there is a gift of prophecy. This one goes a little bit further. And this gift of prophecy is a specific word supernaturally spoken addressing a specific situation at a specific time. Praise God. A specific word supernaturally spoken addressing a specific thing. A specific situation or a specific person at a specific time. It is either directed towards an individual or towards a fellowship. And the result of that word is comfort, encouragement, and edification of the person or of the church. Praise God. But let me remind you here, it is a specific word spoken in a known language. A known language. A language that we know. Praise God. That is good to mark. 
It's good to note that. Prophecy is a word spoken in a language that the speaker knows. First Corinthians 14, chapter 3. We note verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says this. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's it. Prophecy. Praise God. It will always result in comfort, encouragement, and, and edification of a person. Sio ya kushtua watu. Amen. In this gift of prophecy, I know this is where confusion comes in. In this gift of prophecy, as discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there is no mention of foretelling the future. It has nothing to do with foretelling the future. It only deals with the present condition of the church. Like now. Present condition. Right now. What is happening right now. And aims at encouraging or exhorting, building someone. So the gift is edification. To edify is to build. For exhortation. Exhortation is to call people to action. Stop people to move from one point to another. That's exhortation. It calls us. It calls people. Calls you. Calls the church to action. Let us do this. Let us do this. That encouragement. Ex exhortation. And comfort. Comfort is consolation. In times of distress. Sorrow. And suffering. So that gives you the purpose of this gift of prophecy. It does not bring fear. Neither does it bring confusion. It, it can bring, by the way, depending on how it is used in the church. If the church is not careful or, or is not well instructed on how to administer the gift, it can bring confusion, it can bring fear. But the, the spirit of God does not bring fear to people. Amen. God does not give us the spirit of fear. God gives us a spirit of power, a spirit of love. Amen. And a sound mind. Sound mind means that you can think soberly and communicate soberly. Praise God. It doesn't have drama. But at the level of immaturity, the immaturity stage of prophecy, there can be a lot of dramas. That's where people will start going round and round and round to prophesy. You know? You don't have to prophesy like that. It doesn't bring confusion. Amen. Now, most of the time, this gift is manifested in an atmosphere of worship. Atmosphere of praise. Atmosphere of music. Beautiful music. Not just played whichever way. There is a music. By the way, did you know, music ministers to the three, three, three parts of a human being. That's body, soul, and Spirit. There is music that ministers to the body. It stirs up your muscles and excites your, your body. But there is music that also ministers to the soul. And there is music that, that ministers to the spirit. Praise God. Now prophecy comes in when the music being played is the type that ministers to the spirit. Because somehow it lifts up your spirit from an earthly level to another realm. And you can hear clearly. Praise God. And that's how the prophet uh, Elisha used to prophesy. There had to be someone to play some music and then his soul is lifted up to another level. And he gets the message and can prophesy. And I pray that this church people will prophesy. Amen. Why would we claim we have the Holy Ghost? But we have no gifts of the Holy Ghost. 
There's a problem with that. Amen? We cannot claim we have the Holy Ghost, but we don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those gifts are there. I think the problem is just that we really do not know how it works. Most of the time. We don't know how these things work. How they work. Praise God. But in an atmosphere of worship, we need to allow time for prophecy. We need to listen. We need to be careful. Listen. Is the spirit speaking to us? The funny thing is, he does not have to use the people who are on the pulpit. He will use people who are in the congregation. So you know why things don't really happen most of the times? Many of us here, I tell you, I know there are people who are here. There are people who receive messages from God. Praise God. They are right here in our midst. But the problem is, you are too dignified to speak it. Have you look at your neighbor? No. Tell them you are too dignified to speak. Yeah. <laughs> there is one danger here. You see, it's a gift, and it's supposed to build the church. It's a gift. It's supposed to encourage the church. And when God releases the gift through you, it's not for you. It is for the church. Amen? It's for a brother in the church. It's for a sister in the church. So God gives you that today and you're too dignified to speak. So you don't. So the sister or the brother or the church does not receive the word. Now next Sunday, we meet again. God gives you the word. You can see it, you can feel it, you know it, but you are too dignified to speak it. So you don't. So we don't receive the word again. The brother or the sister who is supposed to receive the word does not receive it again. The third time <laughs> it happens, now you are used to that business. Uh, you can only say later on, you know, I felt. So you don't. Now, that is how we lose the gifts of the Holy Spirit from functioning in our lives. Not that the Lord does not want to use us, but because we are unfaithful stewards. When the message comes and you do not pass it on, you are killing people who are supposed to receive that word. You are denying them their healing. You are denying them their opportunity to receive encouragement or to be uplifted in the spirit. So what the Holy Spirit will do is he will find a vessel that is willing and he will use that vessel. Because the message needs to be passed on. Praise God. It needs to be spoken. It's never for you. When God speaks through you, it, that message is not for you. So if you are unfaithful, he will look for someone else who is more ready to do it. Now sometimes the church leadership can be blamed because of not teaching people how to function. Or not even giving that opportunity for people to do that. But if you don't, he has to find another vessel. That's how we lose. So each one of us here is qualified to be used by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Each one of us. It is not only for some people or for a pastor or for some preacher or some apostles or some prophets. It's for the members of the body of Christ. The category of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is for the members of the body of Christ, not preachers. So you wonder why these things are not happening among us. Mostly because we do not know. Most of the time because of fear. Or we are just too dignified to say anything. So the Holy Spirit has to look for another way to communicate to people. And I want to encourage you today, if the Spirit speaks, you have to speak it. Amen. You have to pass on the message. Sometimes we have to be careful also how to pass on the message 
uh, there are some messages you may need. You may need to talk to the pastor. You say, this is what the Lord told me about the church. By the way, that is good in case you are fearing. <laughs> the Lord told me one, two, three. Can pass it on to the church. Now, if you tell me that three times, the fourth time I will tell you now speak to the church. To help you develop in the gift. Sindio. Amen. Praise God. Now, are we together there? So most of the times in worship, the worship leaders need to be, you know, you know, worship leading is an art in itself. It calls a lot, it calls for a lot of connection, a serious connection with the Holy Spirit. Because you need to hear what he is also speaking in the church, what he's speaking to the church. Most of the time when you're leading worship, the spirit also speaks to the church. But he may not speak through the worship leader, he may speak to a member in the church, anyone in the service. You don't even have to be old, in quotes, eh? old in salvation. Anyone, as long as you are a believer, he can use you. So we need to hear, we need to sense, there is a word coming from the spirit for the church, and we give room for the word to be spoken. Amen. That is very important. And we need to see that happening in our midst. And those things are there. It's only that we don't create time for them. I don't know what happened to the church. Who, the, no wonder Paul asks the, Corinthian, the Galatians church, who bewitched you? you know, the, there was a problem. Someone must have bewitched them. So that things that are normal to the church were, not, were abnormal. You know? Things that were supposed to be happening every time in the church were not happening. Why? Because we are not creating that atmosphere. Most of the times our praise and worship services end up being just something we are doing as we wait for the preacher. No? <laughs> Have you been in a, uh, uh, in, in a church where the worship is good, wonderful, people are getting a breakthrough, and then a leader comes, a moderator. Our moderators don't do that. But I've seen in places that the moderator comes with hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know? Because what were you doing? Yeah. What were me worship to? When you're just about to get break, a breakthrough. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Let's keep quiet now. Uh, it's time for offering. You know, that's how witchcraft comes into churches. <laughs> and we block the Holy Spirit from ministering to us because we want our own way. We need to allow the Spirit of God to function freely in the church. Praise God. And when we give him freedom, he will do what he wants to do. No. If we deny him a chance, we will be left there dry. Come to church, do your own program, go home. Nothing. Praise God. Now I need to give you a difference between prophecy and word of wisdom. Do you remember there was a word of wisdom? Because we, con we confuse the two. Because right now, as I talk about prophecy here, some of you believe you know, prophecy is tomorrow there will be great rain. And after election, Wajakoya will be the president. You know, that's prophecy now. That's not prophecy, as we think, according to what we find in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. No. Prophecy, here, as I have said, deals with the present state of things and brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. And it is spoken supernaturally by the Holy Ghost in a known language. A known language. Praise God. You don't have to do it in English. <laughs> a known language. Now, a word of wisdom is for foretelling. Foretelling is addressing, it is addressing the future. Not now. The future. 
It reveals what is coming ahead. Tells you what is ahead. Word of wisdom can tell you there is a, there is a bend. Na uko, uko unaenda kuna ka bend. There is a dangerous bend. It's a warning concerning the future. Or just some revelation concerning the future. It reveals what is coming. It gives warning. It gives instructions to the church or to an individual. That's a word of wisdom. Praise God. Now, prophet, prophet, need to talk about this, prophet. When you talk about a prophet, you are talking about a ministry gift that is found in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. Prophet. That's a person. It's not just a gift. It's a person. Now, a prophet is an administrator. He is an administrator in the church. And not only a local church. Not a local church. Church, the, bo the whole body of Christ, praise God. Not only a local church. Now you remember someone like Daniel in the Bible. Daniel was a leader in Babylon. He was a prophet. Someone like Joseph was a prophet. Uh, Isaiah, men like Ezekiel, and other prophets you find in the Bible, they always worked together with the king. Because they helped the king to lead the nation. Now the nation, uh, like Israel, was a theocratic government. That was, God was the king. God was the head. Everything was the law of God. Kenya is not a theocratic government. It's not. And sometimes we try to force it to be, but it's not. Kenya is very secular. So if you come to a secular government, you want to put a, a prophet from the church next to Uhuru, and then the Muslims also want to bring an imam. And then an Indian also want to bring their own. And all this. Kenya is not a Christian country. It's not. But we are Christians. <laughs> Praise God. So a prophet is an administrator to the body of Christ. Mostly a prophet regulates the operations of the gifts. The operations or functions of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when you talk about a prophet, you are talking about a teacher. They regulate functioning of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church or ministries in the church or in the house of God. He is a teacher. He is a shepherd. He is a father. A father means someone who reproduces himself. A prophet can confer on someone or, uh, or help someone to develop in the gift, especially the gift of prophecy or a gift of the word of word of wisdom or word of knowledge or discerning of spirits. He can do that by just laying hands. And that's what Paul was talking about when he talked to Timothy, that I may come and impart on you some of the gifts by laying on of his hands. So a prophet is not just a person who goes around prophesying. No. A prophet is an administrator in the body of Christ. Praise God. Now, a prophet himself possesses a gift. Other than the things I have told you, he has a gift of the word of wisdom that's functioning through him. He has a gift of the word of knowledge that functions in him. And a gift of discerning of spirits also function in him. Those three gifts are actively working in his life. Uh, apart from the things that I've told you. Now that's a prophet. He is not limited uh, to serve within church, within one fellowship, one congregation. 
a prophet is called for nations, he's called for sinners, he's called for the church, he's called for unbelievers, believers. The, he is everywhere. Because they are establishing the will and the purpose of God on earth. Praise God. Are you getting me? They provide guidance, wisdom that is needed to establish God's purpose. To the nation and all this. That's why they can talk to kings, they can talk to leaders, they can talk to anyone. Nauko, to, uh, to give direction according to the word of God. But the gift of prophecy is for the body of Jesus Christ. You don't go to a sinner to prophesy. It's for the body of Christ. Church like this one now. Amen. But you also need to note that the gift of prophecy can also inspire the gift of the word of wisdom. Sometimes when you give the gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom will also be manifested. So the two will come together. Because this word of wisdom here will give direction on what to do with the gift of prophecy. So most of the times, they may come together. Praise God. As the Lord wills, so will he do. The Bible says the Holy Spirit gives as he wills. Amen. Now, note this. The gift can be lost if always ignored because of fear. You can lose it. If always, what will happen if I speak? What will they say? Won't they say I'm pretending? Won't they say I'm proud? When you start asking yourself those things and saying those things, allowing fear to take charge of your life, you're going to lose it. Gifts, by the way, not this. Gifts are perfect. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are perfect. Praise God. But the vessels that the Holy Spirit use, is using, which is you and me, the vessels are not perfect. But the gifts are perfect. So most of the times, because of the imperfection of the vessel, a gift can be manifested in a way that is not mature. Or in a way that is not good. Or a way that is not perfect. So you can manifest a gift. You can bring forth a gift. But the way you bring it is not good. The gift is perfect. But you as a person, you are not perfect. You need to grow in the manifestation of gift to be perfect. Praise God. So the reason why most of us fear is because we fear making a mistake. We fear going wrong. Now, do not worry, do not be bothered, do not fear making a mistake. Because some of us want to wait until you grow up. Isn't you? <laughs> I, I will wait until I grow up so that I can. Now, if you fear making a mistake now, and you withhold, and you wait until you grow up, the day you grow up, because you will, anyway. When you grow up, the day you will try now to prophesy, you will make the same mistake you would have made 20 years ago. <laughs> there is no escape. You will make a mistake. So you better make it now. Praise God. Instead of making it after you have been in salvation for 30 years. 30. You know? You are not perfect, so you will make a mistake. Making a mistake is not a sin. Praise God. No one will fire you because you made a mistake. With time, you will be more accurate. You will be more exact. So just do it. Praise God. Where are you with me? You know, you are the one I'm telling. Wewe, ndiyo nambia. Wewe, ambayo unanyonga prophecy. I'm talking to you. Speak what the Lord says. Don't fear making any mistake. Praise God. 
Kama mtu wako na shida, yeye akae tu na hiyo shida, wewe usijali. You will make it one day, you will be perfected in it. Amen. A warning here. Just some warning about this. If you have these gifts, don't call yourself a prophet or a prophetess. Say my amen. <laughs> my prophet like dog and my name is prophetess. So and so. Wachana na hiyo mambo. We just manifest a gift. Wachana na title. Amen. Number two. No prophecy is greater than the written word of God. Hakuna prophecy greater than the written word of God. I don't know why people tremble so much when a prophet comes to prophesy, but you don't tremble when you are reading the Bible. No prophecy is greater than the word of God. So any prophecy that comes must be tested against the word of God. You have to check the word of God to confirm whether that thing I'm being told is accurate as far as the Bible is concerned. So don't just be very quick to say amen, 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 amen. No, you receive it, but test it. God allows you to test. Number three, don't rush to accept everything that is said, especially if you do not know the speaker. You know anyone can come to church here and prophesy. Don't jump to saying amen, quickly receiving everything and uh, hallelujah, glory, and you shout. Don't rush. Let the pastor do that if the person is new in the church. Amen? Are we together? Yeah, don't rush. I, sometimes I get very concerned about what happens in Kenya. You know, in Kenya, if we invite, if we invite a Nigerian, for example, let me just say, if, if we would invite a Nigerian preacher, hapa, sahi, na ataubiri, na ubiri vizuri, unajua mutatoa offering, mutampatia offering, na mutampatia offering ambaya mujawai kunipa, mimi, na mimi ni mamu invite, na mimi pasta wenu, lakini ye atakuja, one day, preach one hour, the offering you will give will be much more than something you have ever given before. Iyo ndiyo inaitu wa kurogo. Sema amen? Yeah, iyo ndiyo kurogo. <laughs> Buliza yoneba umerogo? Umerogo? How? How do you give such a... You know, Kenyans, Kenyans are fun, my friend. Una pata the pastor mekauka. When a stranger comes and preaches, anapewa kitu ingine they have never given their pastor. Now I'm not saying you give me now, okay? But what's wrong with that? <laughs> but Kenyans have, we have something funny. We are so overexcited by foreigners, yet you have someone who has been laboring for you, praying for you, fasting for you, seeking God on your behalf, encouraging you, visiting you, and all these kind of things, you don't care. A stranger comes one day, <laughs> one hour. My wife is saying it's an African culture. Your culture ni mekata. In Jesus' name. Yeah. You bless your minister. Yeah, in fact, apa if a preacher comes, aki ubiri yo fire. Yo offering mu metoa, muna nipatia, alafu ni nampatia. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Praise God. Okay, quickly, kidogo, ni, ni, let me mention, na nijua, tumepita 12. Nyinyi muna kuanga na time ya 12 o'clock, eh? Watch it, you get to your tongues. Tongues. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. Let's look at it. There are two kinds of tongues in the scriptures. Two kinds of tongues. I know, I know, Imam Boya tongues, we will be able to do it. So let me mention Kidogo about it. Two kinds of tongues are seen in the Bible. One is 
a gift, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gift of tongues. Now, these tongues is known as prophecy in a language that is unknown to the speaker. Get that well. Do you remember prophecy is given? Prophecy is a word given in a language that you know. Tongues, the gift of tongues, when you are talking about that one in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a gift of tongue is prophecy that is given in a language that is not known by the speaker. That is your speaking Chinese. Now, would you Chinese? <laughs> now, that language can as well be known by somebody else. But the speaker himself or herself does not know that language. Now, when such a message comes, it must be interpreted. That tongue must be interpreted. Must be interpreted. If it is not interpreted, it is useless for us. It is not helping us. It is not benefiting us in any way. Iyo ni yako, na ni yako peke yako, na utaenda na yohivyo. So, what the Holy Spirit does is he gives another gift and that gift is called interpretation of tongues. Praise God. So that when someone gives a message from the Lord in tongues, another person will interpret it for us in a language we know. And therefore it will build us and encourage us and give us comfort. Amen. But if there isn't that kind of interpretation, then it is useless for us. You are making noise for us. Unatusumbua tu wakili. Sasha, umesikia mtu waki prophesy. I have been in places. Let me say, mi ni mesikia. Mtu wana prophesy. In tongues, kabisa, and you know. We know, you are too your prayer. That person is prophesying. Na watu wana sema, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Na mtu wako tongues. Yes, Lord. So the question, what are you saying, yes, Lord, You have to understand for you to say yes, Lord. Amen. So the Holy Spirit gives a gift of interpretation. Now the gift of interpretation simply means when someone is speaking in tongues, you are there and you understand. You know, you can get exactly what they are saying. You don't know that language, but you can get it. If they are speaking Chinese, you can get it kabisa clear. This is what he's saying. Nakimaliza. You have to stand and say, this is what the Lord is saying. Amen. See, you put interpretation, alafu. Now, the other one, I said there are two. The other one is the tongues that are given as evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Tongues that are given as evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And these tongues mostly remain as a prayer language. They remain as a prayer language. Or given as a prayer language and effective intercession. Prayer language or effective intercession. These tongues do not need any interpretation. You don't need to interpret them. It's useless to interpret them. Why? Because the person who is speaking is not speaking to you. Amen? It's not about you. It's about the speaker and God. 
the issue is between two people. The one speaking and the one being spoken to. Those two. It has nothing to do with us. When someone is speaking in tongues, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the person and God. So the interpretation is not needed in this case. Praise God. But I know, I, I also know, I know occasions where someone got an interpretation when someone was praying in tongues, which was very interesting. One of them, one, one, one case, there was a lady praying in tongues in a certain church. Actually, it was not even a church service. She, she just walked in church and she started praying. And as she was praying and praying and praying, a brother was there just hearing what she was saying. And he was getting everything and she was thanking God. Actually, she was thanking God for giving her a boyfriend who is going to marry her. But she was talking in tongues. You know? <laughs> and she praised God and thanked God. It happens. So sometimes one can understand. <laughs> now when you get that, you don't need to go to the person and tell them, you know, this is what you are saying. You know? You don't. But I also, a, a brother, a minister, gave me a story of what happened into the church where he was. A church where he was ministering. One lady started speaking in tongues. And as she was speaking in tongues, another one also picked up. Now those two things, you have to be very careful. When someone is speaking in tongues, silence is supposed to be in the church. Let one person speak. Amen. This is he, a prophecy, yeah? Now, that, it takes a lot of discernment, especially for the leaders of the church to bring the church to silence so that the person can speak in tongues and prophesy in tongues. So a lady did that. Immediately she started. Just a few minutes when she started, another one also started. So two people were speaking in tongues. And, the more one, uh, and when the second one started, the first one raised her voice. She raised her voice, the second one also raised her voice. And there was that, you know, business. A brother in the church was getting the interpretation. The first one who started prophesying started giving the, the church a message. A good message. But the second one, when she started prophesying, she was attacking the first one in tongues and she was saying shut up you don't need to prophesy whatever you are saying I am the one who has the right to prophesy that in the church but she was saying that in church in tongues the members of Akanisa and say, yes Lord yes Lord speak Lord no. speak Lord two people are quarreling in the spirit the church is saying Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. No, no, <laughs> That's why we have to be designed in the spirit. <laughs> so the first one stopped prophesying and started answering back. <laughs> Can you stop interrupting me? Can't you see I'm passing on the message? The other one said, no, I'm the one qualified to prophesy that. You know, <laughs> Church, yes, Lord. You know, Kutupa, Ila Kutupa Mbao, Kanisan. Praise God. So, let me say some things quickly about Ikitu, Ikitu, your tongues, not the tongues, your prophecy. Because I think this is important for all of us to understand. Not the tongues, their prophecy, but this one that is given as a prayer language. Praise God. Because in all the instances of people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, speaking with other tongues is either present or implied. Come anywhere in the scripture where people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will see it is associated with speaking in tongues. 
Amen. So number one, you will find that in Acts chapter 2 verse 4. The initial outpouring of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It is there. They spoke in other tongues. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in other tongues. Amen. And this one, by the way, the tongues spoken here, this first time, Acts chapter 2 from verse 4, were both tongues. We look on a tongues which were prophecies. There were tongues that were just prayer languages and praising and magnifying God. Because you will see they even spoke in strange languages that they did not know. But there were people in Jerusalem that time who had them speaking in their own languages. Amen? So you will see those, those two. Next, when you go to Acts chapter 8, verse 14 to 21, you just note it down. The Samaritans received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. How do you know that? The Bible says, when they saw that the Holy Spirit was given. How do you know, when I'm praying for you, how do I know you, got, you, you have received the Spirit? You can come to me now to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. How will I know you have received? The evidence is tongues. Amen. Paul received the Holy Spirit in Acts 9 verse 17. Now how do we know Paul received the Holy Spirit? You find it in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18. Paul says, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that is more than all of you put together. The reason why Paul said this when he was talking about this, you know the Corinthian church was the most indisciplined, disorganized church. So Paul was bringing order. So the things we are reading here in 1 Corinthians, that's order being restored in the church. Now there were some of the people who used to make noise and fight one another and compete in, giving or in speaking in tongues. But whenever Paul was among them, they never had Paul speaking in tongues. So they started attacking Paul. This guy does not speak in tongues. You know? We Jama and Adubiria does not talk in tongues. You know, those are the things they were raising up against Paul. So when Paul started giving this order here, he tells them, you know, I speak in tongues than more, all of you. It's only that when I am in church, I want to speak edification to the people. Amen. Instead of speaking in tongues. So you can imagine I come here and I start speaking to you here in tongues and I'm not interpreting. The way I'm seeing most preachers doing this day. I, w I went somewhere, to Kar was it Ker Kerugoya? A lunch hour service. There was a preacher preaching. Half the meeting he was speaking in tongues and he's preaching. And I was wondering, what is this man telling us? You know? As if we don't know how to speak in tongues. And I said my statement and I'm like, reba, 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 reba. Then I was wondering, can you please interpret that so that we can benefit? Because we are seated there and you are and we are waiting for you to speak to us. How, do, how are you building me? I am thinking you are mad. You know? <laughs> Praise God. So please, if you are preaching, don't. Don't speak to people in tongues. Unless you are going to, to interpret it. Amen. But if you are praying, do it. Because uh, I'm not praying to you. So, okay. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Let me give you this to help us understand this issue of tongues. Cornelius, that is Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 48. They received the Holy Spirit. The evidence was speaking in tongues. Act chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. The Ephesians church received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Acts chapter 19, verse 6, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Amen. 
Munashika hapo. You are getting it well. Eh? Yeah. Now, mark this. The Bible does not tell you that you must you must speak in tongues. Does not tell you that. That you must speak in tongues. But the Bible tells us that whenever anyone was filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. <laughs> Are you getting? So wewe uamue nini? Chagua, chagua ni lako. He says you it is not there is no place telling us you must speak in tongues. But it is clear that whenever people were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. Do you know I know people who have I knew people who have spoken in tongues when they were go, when they got spirit filled and they got scared at what they were saying and they never spoke in tongues again. Kabisa na hiyo mambo ikaisha na ikaisha na ikaisha. There are preachers who never spoke in tongues. Billy Graham never spoke in tongues. That he didn't even want. Even his meetings when people started speaking in tongues and a musician. Baptist style. Whenever people were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues as an evidence. Amen. And I also think that in uh, <clears throat> speaking in tongues has to do with what James is talking about in chapter 3. James chapter 3 verse 1 to 12 he talks about the tongues ndio Our tongue iko na shida mingi sana so the holy ghost decided to give us a new thing So you can speak in tongues amen Wewe si msema amen Hawa muko hungry Haja niangalie time imeenda najua watu wako hungry But I am not so I'm continuing <clears throat> Amen So quickly It's good for you to get this. Quickly, what are some of the reasons for speaking in tongues? Why do you have to speak in tongues? Hmm? Why? Why do I? Why do I have to speak in tongues? Number one, it is one of the signs of a believer. Mark 16:17. One of the signs of a believer. And those who believe and are baptized will do what? they will drive out demons and they will speak in tongues amen acts mark 16 verse 17 they speak in tongues so that's a sign of a believer reasons why you need to speak in tongues number two, by tongues god speaks to man tongues god speaks to man first corinthians 14:21 utaiona hapo Isaiah 28 verse 11 to 12 utaiona hapo God speaks to man through tongues God speaks to man Okay number three. by tongues man speaks to God By tongues man speaks to God 1 Corinthians 14:2 Man speaks to God for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God praise God can speak to God in tongues And you see one of the things is when you start speaking in tongues to God you are not limited you can speak things that your mind does not understand That's why tongues are there for intercession. Amen. Accurate intercession. Do you know when you begin to speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit takes over your prayer. Amen. And you begin to intercede for people you do not know. You begin to intercede for situations that you don't even understand. You are just praying, but you are actually addressing something that is going on somewhere in the spirit. And you are dealing with it. That's the benefit of praying in tongues. Praise God. Yeah, so you speak in tongues, pray. You can be praying for a family member who is suffering somewhere and you don't even know what they are going through. You can be ministering deliverance to people and you do not even know they are in danger. 
That's what intercession is. The spirit of intercession. Just praying and praying and praying and the Holy Spirit is directing that prayer. Amen. A lady started praying in tongues many years ago. There was a lady who was praying in tongues and she prayed, prayed, prayed and then she noted as she was praying one word she would speak in a language that she knew was his toes, his toes. But then speaking in tongues and then says his toes, his toes. Right at that time as a testimony came in later, there was a preacher who was preaching somewhere in China and uh, there, was a, well, there was snow. Uh, snow came unexpectedly. He was in a very bad place and uh, because of uh, snow, it, what, the, shoes, the shoes he was wearing were not good enough for, for walking on snow. So because of the cold, the toes were almost you know, breaking off because of the hardness. I don't know how that works. You need to go to Mount Kenya to see that. Because they say so. You can get so cold that your fingers fall off. So you try that. Go to Mount Kenya. You can, uh, you can see that a little bit. So actually his toes were going to fall off. But a lady was praying in the U.S. in tongues, but saying, he stores, he stores, he stores. And that's how the, the toes were saved. The guy did not understand how his toes were saved until when he traveled back to the U.S. And, on, and gave a testimony of what happened. And he gave that testimony in a meeting where that lady who was praying was. And that's how she got to know what she was praying for. Praise God. So sometimes get yourself in tongues. Allow yourself to be led by the Spirit. You will pray for things that you don't even understand. So man may speak to God. Next, it is a way to edify and to build yourself. When you are speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 says this. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Amen. Niako, yo niako, yo si yetu, niako. Build yourself. In fact, that's why Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Hide yourself somewhere if you don't want us to hear you. Speak in tongues. Amen. Yeah, some of you don't speak in tongues because you are afraid. Go to the bush. Speak in tongues. Let birds hear. You are building yourself, by the way. You are not building anyone, but build yourself. After all, how will you build as if you don't know how to build yourself? Build yourself. Amen. Okay, next is a way of magnifying God. To magnify God. That is worship. Praising God. You can magnify God when you are in tongues. To magnify God in tongues. It means the spirit of God has taken over. And you can glorify God in a way that you cannot do in a human language. Next, it's a weapon. It's a believer's weapon. Speaking in tongues is a believer's weapon. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Praying in the spirit. Actually that word praying in the spirit means pray in tongues. <laughs> Amen. Praying in the spirit. That's a weapon. I wonder why most of the times when we are talking about the weapons of a, of a Christian. The armor of God. We, we mention all those things. Faith. Nini sword shield, belt, but we never touch on that one. All Praying always in the spirit. See me and the Yeah, praying always in the spirit. It's a weapon for you as a believer. Somebody said, and I agree with the person, he said, when you pray in the spirit, in tongues, demons don't even understand what you are saying. And I like that. Why should they hear what I'm saying? Amen. Next, it is part of the power package. The power package that God has given a believer. Amen. It is there, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The package that is said, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. Amen. It is there. Speaking in tongues is within that package.
You receive power. Amen. Are you seeing why you need to speak in tongues? Okay. I'm finishing. I will go next, next week. I'm finishing. Next, it helps you to pray according to the will of God. It helps you to pray according to the will of God. You write Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Please put it on the screen. Romans 8 26 and 1 Corinthians 14 14. Let's read Romans 8 26. It says this, likewise the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. You getting that? Weaknesses means our limitations. We are limited as human beings. Amen. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. You are limited. You do not know exactly how you should pray and what you should pray for. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Amen. That's when the Spirit of God comes and you begin to groan. Have you ever groaned in the Spirit? You find people groaning in the spirit like women who are giving birth. You remember when Jesus was, you know, kuna watu, by the way, kwa Bible. Jesus is on the cross and he's saying, Lama sabakthani, meandi kwa hivyo, sindio? Lama sabakthani, lama sabakthani. Why is it written like that? When he was raising up a child, he said, talitha kum, sindio? Talitha kum. Why is it written like that? Why were those things not interpreted? So you look at some of the translators and whatever and commentators and they are saying, you know, this is the language that he used to speak, kawaida. And then you wonder, kwa nizo zingine akwa naonge yu language? Those are things they did not understand. That's why they were left like that. Jesus actually, in those words, Jesus spoke in tongues. But those things, they don't, they don't get to them. <laughs> so they may watch your that they are trying to give us interpretation. So why are others interpreted and those ones not interpreted? Praise God. So the Spirit leads us in groanings. When Jesus went to raise Lazarus, the Bible says he groaned in the Spirit. Have you read that? Yeah. He groaned. He was troubled and groaned in the spirit. There is a groaning that can only be done by the Holy Spirit. That's another level of intercession. You know, sometimes tunaomba tu maombi kidogo tu ya chakula, sindio? Sometimes we pray some very simple prayers, by the way. Do you know you can pray prayers mpaka demons wanakuangalia wana sasa unafanya nini? No? What are you doing? There is another level of prayer that goes beyond you as a human being. And it takes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It begins to work in you. You pray prayers. You groan, my friend. And that time when you are groaning, things happen in the Spirit. Check Elisha and Nani Wimwinkin. Gehazi. Gehazi. Do you know Gehazi was given the authority to raise a child? But he couldn't. Can you imagine Umetumwa? And uh, raise up that child. But he couldn't. Now you will see why he couldn't. Because when the prophet came, you know, he went with the staff of the prophet, he put on the child, and then he stood there watching. You know, waiting to see what will happen. And nothing happened. So he took the staff and went back to the prophet and he said, nothing has happened. When the prophet came, the Bible says he fell on that pot. Amen? He started groaning. And things happen. That takes the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 says this. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit, it prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. Amen? It is a spiritual thing. I don't know whether you have prayed prayers. No? What were you saying? You know you went to a depth that you don't understand. In fact, I think I should give people chances here to give testimonies of things that have happened. Because those testimonies are there. Amen. 
Praise God. Okay. Yeah, the last one here. It is spoken of as a refreshing or a resting place. A refreshing or a resting place. Isaiah 28 verse 11 to 12. Verse 11 to 12. A refreshing. A refreshing. There is a refreshing that comes when you are praying in the spirit and speaking in tongues. Amen. And to the Lord. There is a lot of refreshment that takes place in your spirit. And you should not fear praying in tongues or speaking in tongues. In this church, no one will judge you for that. Amen. Praise God. But now, when we go back to prophecy, if someone is prophesying in tongues, the church needs to be silent. But when we are just praying, all of us, we speak in tongues and all this, everyone is supposed to speak and pray and whatever language you can. Amen. Only in prophecy should the church be silent. And then the speakers will speak. If someone is speaking in tongues, uh, uh, if two people want to uh, are getting the spirit of speaking in tongues, the gift is coming. One needs to wait for the other. Where is kusema hiyo power ilikuwa mingi sana? No. No, you wait. The spirit is subject. The spirit of prophecy is subject to the prophet. Amen. In other words, I can hear and hold until the other one finishes and then speak. Hakuna ati nilipushiwa mpaka nikaongea. Hapana. No. The Holy Spirit is very gentle. Amen. Very gentle. Akurushi huko juu, akurudishe chini. Hapana. And then the interpreters can, can rise up and interpret. The service leader needs to be very sensitive in the spirit to get that. Amen. Now, a warning here. The gift cannot operate if the speaker is fearful. <laughs> the gift cannot operate if the speaker is fearful. No tongues can be manifested in the atmosphere of fear. Amen. And the best time, by the way, the best, the best time this happens is always in the time of worship. When we are together and just worshiping the Lord. That's why we need to give worship more time in the church. Let people soak. What the Nigerians say, soaking. Eh? Soak. Let people soak in worship. Ule anasikia njaa ende akanunue. Wende ukanunue mandazi. Wacha watu wafanya nini? We soak in the spirit of worship. We are very shallow in church these days, my friend. We are so shallow. Alafu tukienda, tuko tu kwa social media. Sio kitu ingine. Let's give God time to work on us. You will see how gifts will break through in our midst. Amen. In fact, now, personally, I've started feeling we need to come to church and just be there in God's presence. Alafu watu waende nyumbani. Sio lazima tuubiri. Tumeubiriwa mara mingi. Enda usome notes. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, let's just come and be in God's presence. Just enjoy God's presence. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. He is a better preacher than all of us. Can we stand on our feet? Let's give him time to speak to us, minister to us, build us, strengthen us. And I'm not just saying here when we come to church, even at home. I used to have a